The New World Society in Action. A film produced for you by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in Brooklyn, New York. This tower is on the roof of the Watchtower's Brooklyn Bethel home. From here you can see, on the right, the Empire State Building, then Midtown Manhattan, the Brooklyn Bridge, the skyscrapers of Lower Manhattan, the Wall Street Financial District, and the bustling New York Harbor. This is New York City. Just across the East River from all this bustle of commerce, at 124 Columbia Heights in Brooklyn, is the Bethel Home, the headquarters of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, a center of New World Action, the building from which the work of Jehovah's Witnesses is directed. Bethel means the house of God, and in this house are the Watchtower's president's office and staff, its editorial department, legal department, treasurer's office, and the studios of the Society's radio station, WBBR. It's in this building that many of the things are written that Jehovah's Witnesses use in their gospel preaching. Visitors are always welcome and many come to see what is done in this place. Bethel is located on a quiet street in a pleasant neighborhood. The receptionist in the lobby is always glad to greet those who are interested in the Watchtower's activity and will arrange to show them through the Bethel home. 500 Christian ministers live here. They spend their lives serving you, devoting all their time to publishing the Bibles and Bible literature used worldwide by Jehovah's Witnesses. Taking an elevator to Bethel's 10th floor, we see the President's office, where matters of worldwide importance in gospel preaching activity are handled. At his desk, the Society's President, Brother Knorr, gives his secretary, Brother Henschel, some dictaphone recordings with letters of Christian instruction for the Society's branches. Brother Knorr makes a call, and Brother Henschel, also a director of the Watchtower Society, passes the records to the brother who will type them. All work in harmony and unity, for everyone here is concerned with the advancement of praise to Jehovah's name. For the smooth operation of this efficient preaching organization, the Society's president must keep in constant contact with the various departments as in this instance, where he contacts Brother Souter, the Society's secretary and treasurer, regarding the contract for the Yankee Stadium Assembly in 1953. Brother Souter is going to have some clause in it checked by the legal department. Brother Reamer, another Society director, is here countersigning the checks that pay for supplies. Even with very careful buying, the cost of the supplies needed for the millions of publications used by Jehovah's Witnesses every year is very great. Much of this expense is covered by voluntary contributions, also handled here. Now the contract is sent to the legal department, where the Society's legal counsel, Brother Covington, will check the matter. The legal department is continually concerned with the fight for free worship, giving you the right to hear the truth and to tell it to others. A legal fight for this right to freedom of worship has been necessary in many lands, because opposers are determined that this good news shall not be preached, while Jehovah's Witnesses are even more determined that, by God's undeserved kindness, it shall. Amazing things, these! but it is Jehovah's Spirit that makes them possible. It is His work, not man's. Information on a victory for free worship is sent down to the editorial offices on the eighth floor. Sketches for awake illustrations are being considered when the material from the legal department arrives and is taken care of. 
The brother who will point to the illustrations and page the leaves of the magazine has just fixed up the dummy, which shows where each article and illustration will go in a forthcoming issue of Awake. Meanwhile, the material from the legal office is to be put into article form for the benefit of Awake readers throughout the world. So the news clipping desk's voluminous files of clippings and articles are referred to, and this material is taken to the writing offices by one of the brothers who will prepare the article and submit it for approval. The Society's 3,250 book library is used in connection with the editorial department. Here in the evenings, the members of the Bethel family, both brothers and sisters, may do their studying. The reference works available here provide up-to-date information for lively, informative Bible lectures. This is merely an enlarged version of the ministry school library that you should have at your Kingdom Hall. Also in the evening, back in the editorial department, some Watchtower manuscripts have been measured for space, considered for illustrations, and are put into an envelope that we follow the next morning to the Society's factory at 117 Adams Street. Here we shall see how a watchtower is made. The manuscript envelope is delivered to the United States branch servant, Brother Larson, who is also a Society director. He is in charge of the factory's operation and must see that this material is printed and mailed out on time. Brother Larson gives the manuscript to the dispatch servant who must see to it that each issue of the magazines and other publications move through the factory on schedule. The dispatch servant takes the manuscript to the proofreaders. The proofreaders must check to see that the spelling, punctuation, and grammar are perfect. And when they are finished, the material is returned to the dispatch desk and sent on its way to the linotype department on the seventh floor. Here it is set up in type on one of these 13 typesetting machines. Publications containing the kingdom message can here be set in any language using Roman characters, and also in Greek, Hebrew, Yiddish, Russian, Ukrainian, Arabic, and Armenian. Brother Feckel, in charge of this department, is also a director of one of the society's corporations. There is no exalted position among such Christian brothers. Society directors work here just like anyone else. Brother Feckel is on the extreme left, working on this type that has now been arranged into pages and locked up in metal frames called chases. This type could now be used on small presses, but for the Society's fast rotary presses, a curved metal plate must be made in the way that we shall now see. First, an impression or mold is made by placing a fiber mat on top of the type then some soft blankets. Then all this is put under a hydraulic press that stamps the shape of the type right into the fiber mat. As this is done, a completed mat comes out at the left. The mat is then put into the curved casting box which you see here, and molten metal made up of antimony, lead, and tin is poured into the box where it flows into the impressions that the original flat type made on the now curved mat. While the metal is setting, a curved molded plate that has already cooled can be taken out of the other casting box. This is done. The mat is taken off, and you can see the surface of the type on the curved metal plate. The high spots that might print black on blank parts of the page are routed off, so that the only thing that remains on the plate is the type printing surface. The plate is now prepared to the proper thickness. 
then put into the nickel tank where one and a half thousandths of an inch of nickel makes the plate surface very hard. The plate is then complete, ready to use, and is put onto a wagon and sent downstairs to the presses. But in order to print, we must first have ink. And here you see Brother Swingle, another society director, who handles the department that makes ink, paste, glue, and press rollers. Another brother shows how the ingredients are mixed and ground on an ink mill until their texture is velvety smooth. About 50 tons of ink are made in a year, both black and colors, at a tremendous saving over its commercial cost. Good work is done by these brothers, for the words printed with this very ink may mean life to their readers. Now the plates that we saw made on the seventh floor are put on the Watchtower magazine press on the sixth floor. Soon the ink rolls will be moved into place to supply ink to the type, and with the starting of the press we shall have seen the different steps that must be taken with the Watchtower as it goes through the various departments, is set in type, and finally printed. Watchtower circulation has grown from 40,000 40 years ago to 1,825,000 today. This press works the year round on just the English language watchtower, and one day's production of watchtower magazines, if laid end to end, would stretch 40 miles. Here is the publication of the New World Society. Jehovah has fed us through its pages, and he will continue to do so. The rough edges are trimmed off. Then these watchtowers will be addressed and mailed. But in order for them to be mailed, we must have subscriptions and orders for the distributor's copies. So we go back to the ninth floor office where the mail is being distributed to the various desks. In the service department, mail is handed to Brother Sullivan, another society director who has oversight over this department that handles correspondence with the circuit and district servants and in general looks after the pioneers and congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses. The subscription slips are received by correspondence desks and passed to the magazine department. This address will be copied on a graphotype machine, which impresses it into a metal stencil. These small metal address stencils being typed here are used both as the record of the subscription and to stamp the subscriber's address on each of his magazines. Eleven graphotype machines are needed to type these stencils, which are then filed in metal cabinets. Each cabinet holds 35,000 address stencils. Here are 1,100,000 addresses of people who regularly receive the Society's magazines. Is your address here? The magazines, as you see here, are sent to many places. These trays hold address stencils for China, Burma, Spain, Switzerland, Cyprus, Australia, France, in fact, Watchtower and awake circulation literally girdles the globe. These addresses are stamped on rolls of paper which are cut apart in a hand machine and pasted on the magazines. Or the magazines are addressed and wrapped by machine and then bundled and put into mail bags to go to all parts of the world. These bags containing Watchtower and Awake magazines for tens of thousands of subscribers are stacked on skids to be taken to the trucks at loading platforms on the first floor. Here books are being readied for delivery to steamship or freight lines, and still riding on the skids or wooden platforms, the bags full of magazines are loaded onto one of the Society's four large trucks for delivery to the post office. 
For shipping such quantities of literature, the Society's factory is in an ideal location, being situated in the heart of one of the world's great transportation centers. The Society's trucks delivered their magazines to the post office and have now gone to a nearby railroad siding to get paper for the factory. A great amount of paper is necessary on which to print the books and magazines that tell of the glorious kingdom message. Four freight car loads of paper, about 100 tons, are received each week, loaded on the Society's trucks and transported to the factory, where we shall see a part of this being unloaded. This roll of paper is 59 inches wide, weighs 1,500 pounds, is five miles long, and will last just 40 minutes on the press, during which time it will be turned into approximately 15,000 awake magazines. The operators of all this equipment are Jehovah's Witnesses. They all learned this work after coming to Bethel. They are Christian ministers from many places who have become skilled as efficient linotype operators, truckers, pressmen, and binders, so the kingdom message can be printed at minimum cost. They consider this printing just as important as is the house-to-house -house ministry, in which they also regularly engage. They know that for every extra 60 seconds that this press stands idle, 450 copies of Awake will not be produced that could have been made that day. So almost quicker than it takes to tell it, they have the old roll off, the new on, and the press starts rolling again. From above you can see how the 59-inch roll is printed, cut into strips and these laid over each other so that the pages will fall at the right place when the magazine is folded. Awake now has a circulation of 1,250,000 copies in 13 languages. Issues in two languages, English and Spanish, are printed on this press, two on other presses in this factory, and the other languages are printed in other lands. The Watchtower and Awake are having a great part in preaching the good news of the kingdom. While Awake is published in 13 languages, the Watchtower is in 40. Included here are German, Portuguese, Ilocano, Slovak, Danish, and Twi. Through these magazines in all these languages, the spiritual meat in due season is being provided worldwide. The magazines in languages that have a smaller circulation of around five to 10,000 copies an issue are printed on slower flatbed presses in large flat sheets that are then folded into complete magazines. Smaller printing is done on job presses, which turn out millions of copies of such things as handbills, tracts, informants, subscription slips, letterheads, and the like. The 90,100,000 public meeting handbills that this department produced in 1953 would make a stack five and a half miles high. A great portion of the Society's press room, including the part you see here, is used for the printing of the books, booklets, and Bibles. These are printed in 32-page sections called signatures. The signatures come out of the press that you see on the right and are tied in bundles until all the book's parts are printed, and then it can be bound. Twelve of these 32-page book sections must be printed to make one copy of New Heavens and a New Earth, 27 for a New World translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. The bundles of signatures are put on a conveyor that carries them to a circular chute down which they slide two stories to the bindery on the fourth floor. The book, Let God Be True, is made up of ten of these signatures and now has a circulation of twelve and a half million 
in 31 languages. The thousands of persons who have come to a knowledge of the truth from it will realize the value of the work that their fellow members of the New World Society here are doing. When these pictures were made, the factory was reprinting the book This Means Everlasting Life, which is composed of ten sections. These are here stacked up behind the gathering machine. This machine has pockets for each of the signatures or sections of the book. Its steel fingers drop one signature at a time on a moving conveyor, adding each succeeding 32-page section until all the parts for the complete book are stacked in order. If it should pick up two signatures or miss one, the machine will automatically stop. Then in the sewing department, the signatures are sewed together. Each of these nine machines will sew up to 4,000 books a day. Unusual is the Watchtower Society's efficient method of printing two books on the same signature and not cutting them apart until after they are sewed, thus increasing the production to about four million books a year. After being cut apart, the books are put into a rotary trimmer where the rough edges can be trimmed off of 10 million pages a day. Then the books come to the gluing machine, where the backs of eight books at a time are passed over a cylinder that turns in glue. They next go to the rounder, where the backbone, which is the part of the book that faces you on a shelf, is rounded. This permits it to open easily and to lie flat when opened on a table. The book is then put into the backliner where some cloth called crash is glued on to make a hinge strong enough to hold the cover. And finally, a heavy piece of paper is put on the back to keep the glue from soaking through in warm weather. Next, the covers are pasted on the book in this casing-in machine. The covers were made in the case maker. It glues hard boards on a long strip of cover material and cuts and folds these into the completed covers that come out of the right end of the machine. With this one operation, the covers are complete, except that they do not yet have the title on them. The covers are taken from the case maker to the embosser, where the title of the book is stamped into the covers with gold foil. Here a stack of covers is put in at one end of the embosser, and the brother will take the embossed covers out of the other end. Back now to the casing-in machine, where these covers are being put on the books. From here the books go to the standing presses, where they are stacked between boards to be held under pressure for six to eight hours until the paste that holds the cover on is thoroughly dried. The book is held under pressure for this length of time by iron rods put on both sides of the press. After the books are thoroughly dry, they're inspected, then packed directly into cartons. This means everlasting life, here being packed, has already reached a circulation of four million in sixteen languages, giving countless multitudes the opportunity to learn the course that does lead to life and how they should live today. After being packed into cartons, the books go down to the shipping department on the second floor, where orders are filled for all parts of the world. In an average month, nearly 10,000 cartons of Bible literature weighing some 400,000 pounds will be shipped from here in addition to thousands of smaller parcel post packages and local shipments. Shipping is a major item, for to some places it costs as much as $2.60 to send one of these cartons of 60-bound books. The Society's factory, however, being within sight of Earth's busiest port, is in the best location in the world for such shipping. Why is all this shipping necessary? Because of your activity in the New World Society.
To keep this large factory running, many things, of course, are necessary. The brothers who work in the machine and the electrical shops give good care to the expensive machinery that must be used in such extensive printing, and this care gives it a long life. The plant's electricity is produced by this 525 horsepower diesel engine and generator. Its power runs all the equipment you have seen in this building, and from the factory's lobby, visitors can view this final example of how, here, everything possible is done to save on expenses, even to the point of producing the plant's own electricity. As these visitors transact their business with the society, we note that it is now supper time, and the brothers who have been working hard all day are leaving the factory, which is situated in a very prominent place in Brooklyn, and are walking the few blocks to the Bethel home. We are glad that we had the opportunity of visiting this place and of seeing how the publications that brought us the truth are produced, and how our brothers work diligently to provide this literature for us. As we walk toward Bethel, we find that these brothers often hurry, looking forward to their evening meal and to study or service that evening. After their evening's activity and a good night's rest, we see them coming down to breakfast the next morning. At the breakfast table, in a procedure followed by all the Bethel families throughout the world, they first enjoy the spiritual food of the daily scripture text and comments, which are discussed for 15 to 20 minutes each morning. After this, one member of the family represents them in prayer, and then they have their breakfast. Preparing some 1,500 meals a day for this family of 500 persons is a big job, and food is a major item. However, its cost is kept to a minimum by having much of it raised by brothers who work on the society's several farms. Such matters as farm production and the purchasing of food are handled by the Bethel office. Brother Ulrich, also a director of one of the society's corporations, is here handling food and supply records. Additionally, these brothers see to such matters as the cleanliness and general operation of the Bethel home. Sisters who are members of this family also do good work. Dusting the rooms, washing the sinks, cleaning the windows, and generally keeping this place neat and clean. For the convenience of this big family, there is a tailor shop that does cleaning and pressing work for a small charge, enabling the brothers to make a neat appearance as representatives of the theocratic organization. A sister does alterations of clothes. A brother takes care of the hairdressing and barbering and other brothers do shoe repairs for the Bethel family, repairing about 75 pairs of shoes each week. Then there is the laundry, where the shirts and socks, the linen and bed sheets, the towels and pillowcases are kept clean and spotless. Bethel is run like a very large hotel would be, if such a place as a hotel could have the spirit and family unity of Christian love. Since so many clothes could not be hung up to dry, machines use centrifugal force to throw the water out as they whirl the clothes dry. The sheets, pillowcases, towels, and other things are ironed on large machines, put in proper order, and sent to the supply rooms for use on the various floors. All is efficient. Nothing is wasted. Having this equipment enables more work to be done, and money actually is saved. How would you, for instance, like to iron 1,500 shirts a week? Or, perhaps, darn the socks and repair the clothes for 500 of your Christian brothers? Yes, all these things and many more must be done so that this family may most efficiently serve their brothers throughout the world. 
aiding in the praise of Jehovah's name. As the day goes on, we find that appetites increase, and the noon meal that the cooks have been working on all morning must be served. At mealtimes, the entire home and factory close down so that all the brothers may eat together. The kitchen is well equipped, even having its own bakery which produces 400 loaves of bread a week and prepares excellent pastry. Good, wholesome food is prepared, for the Bethel family works hard and has a healthy appetite. The cooks are preparing chicken for dinner. These were raised on the society's farm. While they're doing this, others are cleaning and preparing the vegetables. Also in the Bethel home is another instrument used in the gospel preaching, the studios of the society's radio station, WBBR. The announcer introduces a program, signals the control room, and this Bible study group is now on the air, studying, for the benefit of the radio audience, the book, New Heavens and a New Earth. Similar studies are put on throughout the week. The broadcasting transmitter which we shall visit is about 25 miles away at the Society's property on Staten Island. Many persons have heard the Kingdom message and have come to a knowledge of the truth as a result of this station's broadcasts and the work of the brothers who operate it. The voices from Brooklyn go through the broadcasting equipment here and are thrown out over the air with 5,000 watts power to serve a tremendous audience of some 15 and a half million people with the good news that God's kingdom is for man's benefit. The executive department of the Watchtower Society has its study here at Staten Island, and here we find Brother Franz, the Society's vice president, looking up certain information and preparing scriptural articles for publication. The research is careful and thorough, the information reliable and authoritative. A special reference library is here used in connection with this message of the New World. So we leave WBBR's 411-foot-high transmission towers at Staten Island, towers whose invisible waves carry a message of life and return to Bethel, where a watchtower organ broadcast is originating. This auditorium studio is also used as a kingdom hall, and just before the great Yankee Stadium assembly in 1953, it was the scene of a meeting of watchtower branch servants from the four corners of the globe. Branch servants from 65 lands and representatives from even other countries presented problems encountered in missionary work, and these were ironed out by the Society's president. Many of these branch servants had graduated from the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead, where as at Bethel, visitors are always welcome. Located in the highlands above Lake Cayuga, 250 miles northwest of New York City, this school is devoted to training missionaries, promoting Christian education. The day at Gilead, as at all of the Watchtower's homes, begins with the students and the farm family assembling in the dining room for consideration of the daily scripture text. Questions are offered regarding the text, and comments are given by members of this family who are called upon at random by the one at the head of the table. Thus, the minds of all are alerted, since all must be on their toes prepared to answer. Others may then volunteer comments, and the matter is summed up by reading what the yearbook says about the text.
We hurry along now with one of the classes. This is Classroom D in the library building, where these brothers are studying the promises of God's Word, the fundamental doctrines of the Bible. On nice days, the public speaking session is often held in very pleasant surroundings, out by the fish pond in the little amphitheater that was built by the students and the farm family. After the regular classes are completed, the students assemble in the main auditorium where they are here learning about prayer wheels. A number of the brothers here will work with the New World Society in lands where these are used so they're learning what the people believe about such things, in order that the truth may be properly presented to them. Many matters are here discussed, including the true religion concerning Jehovah God and Christ Jesus. In the lounge at the far side of the room is a picture of each class that has graduated from the school and gone on to foreign lands. After their classes are over, the students are not yet through for the day. They help on various jobs at the school or around the farm, perhaps assisting with the milking of the excellent dairy herd that provides dairy products for the feeding of the brothers both here and in Brooklyn, or perhaps working in the gardens, or helping with the cheese making and storage, which cheese storage you see here. These Christian ministers are busy people. In the evenings they must still study their lessons, do research, and prepare their discourses. In this, the 9,000 volume library is of great value. The wisdom and knowledge available here are spread around the world as these brothers go to missionary assignments in all parts of the globe. Thus, another busy day ends for the Kingdom Farm family and the students of Gilead's 21st class, who had studied diligently, shortly before their graduation at the great Yankee Stadium Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses in 1953. Were you there? Well over 150,000 people were fortunate enough to be able to attend this glorious eight-day New World Society Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses in Yankee Stadium, New York, July 19th through 26th, 1953. From the world around they came, from more than 90 lands, and ahead of them they had sent their greetings which were depicted in vivid colors on these large banners all the way around both levels of the inside of the stadium. From Norway and Mexico and Argentina, happy people had come. From the world's four corners they had gathered to consider God's word and to declare themselves for his new world. Our Christian brothers from many lands had assembled in this one place without controversy, with none of the quarreling and greed of the old world. These people had one purpose, one mind. They were people of all races and colors, formerly of all creeds, from all nations and kindreds and tongues, but united in service to Jehovah, in the bond of love and Christian brotherhood. These people came from the ends of the earth just to hear the truth, just to hear Jehovah's word expounded. Their joy and happiness showed the spirit that will be evident in the new world, only the power of Jehovah God could accomplish such unity as was evident among the happy people from many lands that you see here. Truly, this was an outstanding example of the New World Society in action.
What did they see and do here? The program outlined in this attractive booklet showed that the first day would include the graduation of the 21st class of Gilead, the one that we just visited. The sky was clear, the sun was bright, anticipation was high. Attention was immediately grasped by the beauty of the platform, so excellently arranged on what was normally a baseball playing field. The 127 Gilead graduates and the 126,000 others in attendance were addressed by the school's instructors and then by the society's president, Brother Knorr. One of the most stirring sights of the graduation was when all the graduates of former classes who were in the audience were asked to stand. These were faithful ministers who had participated in the growth of the New World Society in their area, sometimes from a small handful to many thousands during the less than eleven years since Gilead's first class had begun. Of the sixteen hundred missionary graduates from Gilead who are now in the field, this nine hundred and forty-five had been able to come in from the field, which is the world. Just look at the number of them who were there. This fine example of faithfulness in their assignment was set before the graduating 21st class, here seated on the field at each end of the wide platform. From this beautiful platform, the great shepherding work was discussed, and it was pointed out that it isn't hard to identify the false shepherds or the true ones today. Brother Franz, the Society's Vice President, admonished the graduates to fully accomplish their ministry and to show Christian love in their assignments. After receiving this good admonition, the students filed up to receive their assignments and their diplomas, and to learn where they would be sent in the world to continue their ministerial activity. Brother Schroeder, the registrar of Gilead, assisted Brother Noor in issuing the diplomas to students from 28 lands, who would go to 44 countries, to Europe and Africa, Asia and Latin America, and Jehovah's rich blessing would be with them. Indeed, it was a joyful time, full of keen anticipation of marvelous blessings in the service of the Creator. In the evening, the students told of life at Gilead, and entertained with a pleasant program of songs from their native lands. The first day ended and the next came. The great resolution went on record before God and all men, with the declaration that Jehovah's Witnesses are one united New World Society and will abide firmly by its godly principles. The new witnessing aid, Make Sure of All Things, was released to a most enthusiastic audience, and Yankee Stadium was the scene of great rejoicing as Jehovah's Witnesses determined to use this new aid zealously in all their ministry. The audience's enthusiasm is manifest in these happy faces. Of course, between the assembly sessions, material food was also necessary. So as they examined, make sure of all things, these brothers were on their way to the convention's cafeteria, which was indeed an amazing place. 4,500 brothers volunteered to operate this most efficient feeding arrangement, which served literally tens of thousands of meals each day. The food was good, the cost reasonable, the appetites healthy ones. From 38 such serving lines, the food was carried to the tables provided in the next tent. brothers in the large and efficient kitchen worked hard to get everything ready on time. And after eating in the cafeteria, the conventioneers returned to the stadium for more spiritual food.
Tuesday morning, there were meetings of the Society's Circuit, Branch, and Public Relations servants. And in the afternoon, Brother Knorr released Preach the Word, a 32-page booklet containing the kingdom message in 30 languages, so that any Christian minister could witness in any major tongue. Of course, English was not the native language of many in attendance, so meetings were held in various parts of the stadium on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday mornings in 20 other languages. Armenian, Greek, Norwegian, Polish, Russian, Slovak, Spanish, and other tongues. At the Greek meeting, a new Bible aid was released. Just one of the 75 made available during this assembly. Another outstanding Tuesday joy was hearing Brother Fran speak on the theocratic organization. Wednesday morning, a large crowd was on hand to hear the nine o'clock discourse on baptism. These 4,640 new Christian ministers, 1,600 more than were baptized at Pentecost, arose to indicate that they would this day symbolize the dedication of their lives to Jehovah. With heads bowed in earnest prayer, this is the multitude that would be immersed. In an orderly manner, appropriate for members of the New World Society, the immersion candidates walked out to the sidewalk to board the special buses that operated a constant shuttle service to the immersion pool. Baptism is an important act for the Christian and one must be completely dipped under the water, just as Jesus was immersed in the Jordan River. These people have studied God's Word, accepted the truth, and now want to prove their appreciation by obeying Jehovah's instructions and dedicating their lives to Him. Such a baptism indeed amazed the neighborhood. Of special interest to those watching was the non-nationalistic aspect of this spectacle. Persons of many national backgrounds were represented. Many of the amazed onlookers watched from their rooftops and fire escapes and noted the great difference in age of those baptized, thus seeing that true religion draws youths as well as older men. The act of being dipped has no value unless the one being baptized has dedicated his life to Jehovah. But when he has made that dedication, he should be immersed as an outward symbol that this dedication has been made. Of those immersed, 1,861 were men, 2,779 were women. Another outstanding assembly provision was the New World Society Trailer City, 40 miles away near Dunellen, New Jersey. The convention is still on, but everything that happens at Yankee Stadium can also be heard out here. Clearly, but unobtrusively, the strains of fine music float through the air. Then the voices of speakers who dwell calmly but eloquently upon Bible teachings that have to do with life and good works. Large, loudspeakers in the city's two sections can be heard no matter where you are, whether in your trailer or tent, or at the space set aside for the audience to sit. Amazingly, most of this orderly city sprang up practically in one day. 20,000 persons moved in within 12 hours, and that is one every three seconds. A groceryman who supplied much of the city's food said, I can sense the difference the minute I turn off the highway. And indeed you could. All necessary facilities were provided. The city was operated entirely by volunteers 
and it even had its own fire department, which was used mainly to water down the streets. Cafeteria boilers, shower buildings, and other facilities had been set up, the labor having been volunteered by Jehovah's Witnesses who live in the area. Yes, many things were needed. In this tent, even a well-staffed first aid department was at hand to take care of any difficulties or illnesses. The food and other supplies for this big city had been ordered and arranged for long in advance, and at the moment they were needed, they came in by the truckload. Good planning made everything available at just the right time. Here are some of the trucks that were in Trailer City at one time. In the hot weather, perhaps handling the city's supply of ice had its advantages. At the two well-stocked grocery stores, food was available at a reduced cost. Even the children, though typically energetic, were quietly subdued. They were listening, talking, learning, quietly playing with one another, occasionally getting tired and going to sleep. The grocery man who commented on the city's orderliness said, No loud noise, no rowdiness, no harshness. You come away realizing you just visited a big city without hearing one harsh sound in it. That is something, he said. That is a modern-day miracle. The interest of all these earnest people was centered around the good message coming from Yankee Stadium. Indeed, this Christian gathering produced some city. Built to last just a little more than a week, it gives some idea of what Jehovah's Witnesses can do after Armageddon, being able to live almost anywhere, to move from one section to another, or to assemble in small groups. They built and operated the entire city, harvesting the wheat that had stood on this land, laying out the streets, putting in the plumbing, the kitchens, taking care of any who were sick. As Isaiah 32, 18 puts it, these people abode in a peaceable habitation, in safe dwellings and in quiet resting places. Among these Christians, policemen were unnecessary. Only traffic directors were needed, and even these were Jehovah's Witnesses. At a speed of 120 miles an hour, we're flying by this outstanding example of the New World Society in Action. That 45,000 people could dwell together in such a city in unity, with no wrangling or fighting, nor any need of force to keep the peace, can be accomplished only when Jehovah's Spirit is backing them up as it is doing here. And so we return the 40 miles to Yankee Stadium where the program continues. Again, the stadium is packed to capacity to hear the Watchtower's president speak on Walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever. He showed the shortcomings of the new Revised Standard Version Bible, its omission of the name Jehovah, and the importance of that name. This discourse concluded with announcement to his audience of Volume 1 of the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, which is now being widely used along with the Christian Greek Scriptures translation made available in this same stadium in 1950. Brother Henschel showed that this is the day Jehovah provided for a great crowd to hear the truth and be saved. Did we say, hear it? Well, even those who could not hear with their ears could see these good words. In Brother Covington's long-to-be-remembered discourse, he likened his vast audience to lawyers who are teaching God's law to men of goodwill, faithful ministers who stick to their territory. 
Brother Schroeder reminded that Jehovah's Witnesses have a common faith, a common feeding program through the Watchtower magazine, and are under the leadership of our reigning King, Christ Jesus. Then Brother Fran's striking Thursday discourse. New World Society attacked from the far north, forcefully sounded the alarm of Armageddon. As the days passed on, many new publications were released. These were some of them. This was climaxed on Saturday with release of the thrilling new English book, New Heavens and a New Earth. A tremendous amount of advertising was done. Five million one hundred thousand handbills were used. Two hundred five thousand of these lapel tags. There were 160 signs on the highways and the big signs on Yankee Stadium. New York City was impressed. And Sunday, July 26th, New Yorkers came by the tens of thousands, for this was the climactic day. Inside, anticipation was growing high. Under the warm sun, every seat was taken. No more could be allowed in the stands but there were still thousands more who would not be disappointed. The gates were opened, and with the women removing their high-heeled shoes so they would not ruin the turf, 7,500 more persons flooded in, in an orderly manner, to sit on the playing field and hear the warning of Armageddon and the hope of the new world. That so many were anxious to hear of God's way brought a great stir throughout the audience. Then a mighty roar of enthusiasm. It was indeed a happy time of prosperity for Zion, a sight never to be forgotten. This was a result of kingdom preaching. Four o'clock came and the speech began. 91,562 persons were in the stadium. 74,267 more listened from the surrounding tents and from Trailer City, making a total of more than 165,000. And an unnumbered multitude listened over radio station WBBR. Brother Knorr appealed solely to sober judgment. To his attentive audience, he explained, Armageddon will be the worst thing to hit the earth within the history of man. God's new world will be the best thing ever to come to distressed mankind and will never pass away. The new world's king, Christ Jesus, will provide a home worthy of his family, a paradise of health and life. This privileged audience heard scriptural proof of these divine promises, and you can read it for yourself in the printed copy of this inspiring talk, this booklet, After Armageddon, God's New World. A great multitude had here spent eight days in New World living, yet they were still to see much more. During the three days following the assembly, more than 15,000 of these brothers visited the Society's Brooklyn plant, the place where the message of the New World is printed and sent to all parts of the earth. Quite extensive construction is underway near the factory for a highway, park, and civic center, and in this reconstructed area, this factory will make a good appearance for the New World Society. The visitors then walked a few blocks to the Bethel home, this ten-story red-brick building with a large watchtower atop it, and its back to the lower Manhattan skyline and the East River. The visitors were thrilled with what they saw, and the neighborhood marveled at the good Christian conduct of Jehovah's Witnesses. In three days, 15,418 visitors came through the doors of this home and were indeed made welcome. They witnessed the tranquility and peace of this place, where Christian love prevails, and the society was glad to have them visit here.
This is the lounge on the first floor. The stairway leads up to WBBR's observation room. Visitors are generally ushered to this lounge to see someone at Bethel. Monday nights, the lounge is converted into one of Bethel's seven theocratic ministry school classrooms. In the society's library, members of the Bethel family can do their studying and prepare their talks. Here are Bible concordances, dictionaries, commentaries, various translations, and other books on many subjects. In the Kingdom Hall, each Monday evening, the Bethel family assembles to study the Watchtower, studying the same lesson that these brothers will have in their congregations the following Sunday. Even on as hot an evening as this one was, the Bethel family appreciates the importance of this study, for they know that this spiritual food gives one strength, and that all who are interested in serving Jehovah must follow the scriptural instruction to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together. The visitors also saw WBBR's studios, where Brother Macmillan is reading material from the watchtower. Then many of them went out across the New York Harbor, past the Statue of Liberty, to Staten Island, where the station's transmitters are located. Radio station WBBR speaks out boldly with well-rounded out, pleasingly informal programs. In New York, where many exclusive apartment house dwellers are beyond the reach of a door-to-door -door kingdom publisher, this station's 5,000-watt voice of praise to Jehovah tells its listeners that the troubles of today are signs of the kingdom's establishment. The brothers who work in the vegetable gardens on the station's grounds produce food that helps to feed the Bethel family, cutting down on costs so that the Bible literature can be presented to the people at very low contributions. The Watchtower Society is in no way commercial. It is philanthropic and educational, and all its parts work together so that this gospel of the kingdom can be preached throughout the world for a witness. Thus, even these vegetables will aid in that proclamation. Many brothers returned home by way of the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead and marveled at the campus that has there been developed. It isn't elaborate, but just shows what can be done when a few brothers want to beautify a place. Members of the farm family and Gilead students have added improvements and have created what many visitors have described as a sample of the peaceful tranquility of the new world. What a joy that new world will be! with all who are living praising Jehovah, with a spirit of peace and Christian brotherhood extending to all men wherever they live, with Eden's blessings restored to earth. Then, as the psalmist long ago promised, the earth will indeed yield its full increase. Then the earth will become a paradisaic garden, the great Creator, the Almighty Jehovah, has promised just such a thing, and the promise is sure, for He is the Maker of the heavens and the earth. Eventually, the whole world will be such a garden. But first, a great witness work must be completed. So by all the means of transportation they had used to come to this New World Society assembly, by seaway, railway, airway, and highway, Jehovah's Witnesses returned to their home territories, to there awaken many more men of goodwill to the old world's end and the blessings of the new. They recognize each meeting at their kingdom halls as a small assembly of the New World Society. Zealous in house-to-house -house service every Sunday morning, they know that the door-to-door -door kingdom publisher 
is the backbone of the New World Society in Action. A mature publisher goes along with a newer one in Jehovah's service, as they call at the door of a modern home in the United States. When the new one becomes proficient, she will take another publisher along with her only occasionally, for much more can be done if each takes a house. The new one makes her own presentation, but when the lady raises a question, the mature publisher comes to the new one's aid by referring to make sure of all things. Its scriptural proof helps overcome the householder's objection. Another group of New World Society representatives finds a man working in his yard and encounters a certain difficulty. Oh, he can't understand English. Well, that's all right. We have the kingdom message in his language, too. He can read it right here in the new booklet, Preach the Word. It will present the hope for life. You see, this work isn't just of one nation, or one nationality, or one people. You can cross seas, going to many lands, and there find Jehovah's Witnesses doing the same work, having the same zeal, conducting the same type of assemblies. This, for example, is Wembley Stadium in London, where this August 1951 assembly proved a dynamic stimulus to the practice of pure worship. 36,000 persons here heard the lecture, Will Religion Meet the World Crisis? These are some of the happy people who attended this five-day Christian gathering. This is Frankfurt, Germany, and these are people that Hitler was going to destroy. Yet at this assembly in 1951, 47,000 were in attendance, and 2,373 were baptized. Their faith shows none of the apathy of so many of today's churchgoers. Apathy doesn't carry you through years of Nazi concentration camps, or make you stand firm in communist lands, or allow you to risk jail as many from Germany's eastern zone did to attend this assembly. This is Johannesburg in the Union of South Africa in December 1952 illustrating that the New World Society is in action in many tongues throughout the earth, at this assembly, talks in English and Afrikaans were translated into Zulu and Susutu for brothers who speak those languages. Brother Henschel of the Brooklyn Bethel family here speaks through two interpreters. Despite rain, Shelter was found in the stands, and even when these brothers had to stand outside for as long as an hour waiting for food, never was a word of complaint heard from them. In Salisbury, southern Rhodesia, 250 Europeans met in assembly, and 15,000 Africans, some of whom you see here. There were no great stadiums here, so the multitudes, reminding us of those who came to isolated places to hear Jesus, gathered out in the open under clear skies to listen to the message, that people from many different tribes and all parts of the land could meet with no fighting or bloodshed amazed the Africans, the police, and the Europeans. It was taken for granted, however, by the Christians who were in attendance. These witnesses of Jehovah, your Christian brothers, know what they believe can prove it from the scriptures, are zealous in their activity and considered it well worth the effort to come and hear the good message. A hundred and forty-five persons were in attendance at a European assembly at this hall in Kitwe, northern Rhodesia, in December 1952. And at the African Assembly at Kitwe, an amazing 20,000 were in attendance. Here again, in the heart of Africa, there was no stadium, but that didn't stand in the way of these energetic witnesses for Jehovah. 
they cut enough material from nearby forests to make benches for more than 18,000 people, a quarter of the seating capacity of New York's famed Yankee Stadium. Yet this was not in one of the world's great cities, but in a clearing in Central Africa. How could so many people be accommodated? To sleep 8,000 of the conventioneers, the brothers cut many thousands of poles, 30,000 bundles of grass, and built 17 of these sleeping shelters that radiated out from the seating area like great spokes of a wheel. Some of these were 700 feet in length. Put yourself in their place. Some of these people rode bicycles for two weeks, traveling more than 500 miles each way. Others walked four days through an area of wild beasts, then traveled two more by primitive bus to reach this assembly. All of Jehovah's Witnesses should have such zeal for assemblies. Brother Noor spoke eloquently on, It is time to consider God's way. The brother on the right is translating the talk into Sibemba for the benefit of the assembled multitude. Another never-to-be-forgotten part of this assembly was the singing of powerful hymns of praise to Jehovah. A choir of 1,010 led 18,000 voices. These hymns, composed in the native languages by African brothers and sung with genuine zeal for Jehovah, left visitors with tingling spines and with tears of joy in their eyes. Lift up your eyes and view the fields, said Jesus, that they are white for harvesting. Today the harvest is great. The restoration of true worship expands to the ends of the earth. The New World Society is indeed in action. You can participate and have the zeal of all these people you have seen by associating with Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Society, through whom Jehovah has provided you with this New World message. So, since it means your very life, take as your everlasting determination the psalmist's vow. Every day will I bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever.